right, so we are still in, uh, we, the last few weeks we've been doing a teaching called The Beginning and the End, Genesis and Revelation. Today is the last day that we are looking at Revelation. If you've been here, you know we've just been looking at the main points in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And the reason we're doing that is because Genesis 1 through 11 is the foundation for everything else that we see in Scripture. And we know that Scripture is the foundation for living and holding to a biblical worldview. Now, what, what is a biblical worldview? Well, that means that we approach life and interpret the things happening in our world and our culture through the lens of Scripture and not popular opinion. The Word of God may not al- always be popular, but the Word of God is always true. Can you say amen? I got a couple on that one. That, that's, that's everything in a nutshell. If the Word of God says it's true or it's right, then it's right. If the word of God says it's wrong, then it's wrong. It doesn't matter how much you try to change. You can change what is on the paper, but you can't change what God says. You can try to take things out of scripture, but it doesn't change scripture because God's word is final. And we've learned throughout these last few weeks that God is faithful to his promise and his word is true. If God said he will do it, he will do it. Scripture says that he who promised is faithful. It also says that he who began a good work in you will finish it to completion. Now today we are going to be in Genesis chapter 11, and we're going to look at the Tower of Babel. And just to involve, I know we have the kids in here today. Um, I need a couple uh, kids to come up and, and help me with something before we get into the rest of the sermon today. I see hands. Go ahead and come on up. Have you come up? Can I have one more? We have three right there. We can have four. There we go. I want to bring you guys over here. Do you guys like to build stuff? Come this way. Do you guys know what the Tower of Babel is? Okay. Well, you'll learn later. What it is, it was a really tall tower they were building. Okay. So can you come over here, buddy? Can you come help us? You just want to hang out over there? That's okay, too. You, you can be the supervisor and tell them what they're doing right and tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, so what we're going to do, there he comes. You guys want to do boys against girls? Yeah? Okay. All right, so we'll give the girls this block, this pile. The boys, you're going to use this one, and I'm going to time you. I'll give you like one or two minutes. We're going to see who can build it the tallest, the fastest, without it falling down. Okay. You can either go in a single column or you can make a couple to try to make it stronger and build it up that way. But you get to choose how you build it. All right? And everybody else is going to cheer you on while we're doing it. Sound good? Okay, so boys, you get this one. This is yours. Girls, that's you. All right? You ready? Don't go until everybody's going to help count us down. You guys help me count down three, two, one, and when I get to one, everybody says go. Three, two, one. Ten seconds. There's a definite height advantage going on right here. (laughs) Oh, three, two, one, stop. All right. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. I think think the girls won, but that was a good try. Good job. Good job. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Do I get one? There you go. One out of two is not bad. It's all good. So the Tower of Babel is what we're looking at today. This is, this is going to be the shortest out of all the, 
teachings on Genesis we did. Uh, it kind of works out that it, it happened that way because of all the other stuff we have going on today. But while this is only about nine verses, it has a uh, huge impact even on the world and life as we know it today. So it may only be nine verses, but these nine verses have a huge impact on what we see today. So let's pray one more time over the scripture, and then we're going to get into the main part of the message today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is faithful, your word is true. Father, we thank you for our young people that are here with us today that we saw helping in ministry. Father, we thank you, and we believe here at this church that our kids are not the generation of tomorrow. They are the generation of today because they are here and alive with us today. We pray your continued blessing upon them. Uh, Father, that your presence and your purpose would overflow from their lives. They would have an incredible impact in their schools, uh, in their clubs, their sports, uh, their sport groups, everything they're a part of, Father. And for the message, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us today. Father, if there's anybody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that you would draw them to that place today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 11, this is about 100 years after the flood that we looked at last week. So about 100 years have passed, and based on the the list of families in Genesis chapter 10, a lot of scholars and theologians believe there was probably about 1,000 people on the earth at this time. So we're going to go ahead and dive into Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So you see the people, just like the the kids, of course, the kids are leaning a little bit, but you see the people trying to build a tower. And it tells us what they used to build the tower with the bricks and the asphalt. But what the first important thing we're going to look at today is it said, the people said to one another, let's make this tower and let's make a name for ourselves. That is very important because they they weren't saying, let's honor God, let's make a name for God, but let's make a name for me. Let's make a name for ourselves. This is referring to self-glorification. They wanted to be glorified rather than God. It means they wanted renown. They wanted fame. But see, there is only one who is good and worthy of glory, and that is God and God alone. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what people try to to push or say is true or say is okay. God and God alone is worthy of praise. Scripture tells us there is one name under heaven in which you must be saved, and that name is Jesus. There's one name that at the end that every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord, and that is Jesus. You see, this was directly against what God had commanded and blessed them to do. He said, be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth. But as you're reading this, there's no reference or reverence to God anywhere. Last week, we looked at at, at the flood and how wickedness and sin was so prevalent in mankind. And now 100 years later, we see the same pattern coming. There's no reverence to God. God had been removed from the equation. Does that seem familiar with anything that we see today? If you look in scripture, does it ever end well when God is removed from the equation? Never. It never ends well when we say we're going to push God out of this and we're going to do it our way. See, they wanted to do things their own way. This was a direct rebellion and defiance against God. And it was serious enough what they were doing with this tower that God came down to see what was happening. Anytime that God comes down, steps into a situation in scripture, it was a big deal. 
whether it was to bless them and, and to give them a promise and a promised blessing, or he came down to bring uh, judgment and discipline. God came down to intervene. Look at the other times he came down after man had sinned and basically said, no, we're going to be God of our own lives and do things our way. Look at the garden. Adam and Eve sinned. God came down. Last week, you look at Noah and the ark. God intervenes in the sin and the wickedness of mankind. Fast forward into another place in the New Testament, Sodom and Gomorrah. God comes down when he gets pushed out of society. But you're going to see here in a second that many times, you've heard me say this many times before, even when there's uh, consequences and there's judgment, there's always a glimpse of grace and blessing within that. But moving on to verse 9, he says, but the, it says, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. That phrase, sons of men, is important because earlier on in Genesis, when it was referring to Seth, who was the, the son of Adam and Eve, it referred to his descendants as the sons of God because they were, they were pursuing God and worshiping him. And it referred to the descendants of Cain as the sons of men because they were going the opposite way of God and, and, and worshiping self, their selves. So for here, for it to say the sons of men, this is saying that everybody that was present here at the Tower of Babel, because it calls them the sons of men, they were not pursuing God, but they had started pursuing their own way. It's saying their hearts had turned away from God. These people were following their own way. But if we're being real this morning, it's either God's way or Satan's way. So when we say, I want to do things my own way, whose way are we actually doing? It's actually Satan's. I know that may seem blunt. And like, I don't feel like I'm following Satan. You're either following God or Satan. And when it really comes down to it, maybe not intentionally, but that's the truth. But we see here they are one with one language. They were united for one purpose. I want you to realize this morning, unity is incredibly powerful, whether it's unity to accomplish good or unity to accomplish wickedness. You can look throughout history and see groups of people that were united even for a wicked purpose that accomplished horrific yet large-scale things. So unity is powerful, and it can accomplish great things, whether they're good or bad. And here, when God comes down, he says they, are, they were one. They were unified, and he says nothing they do will be withheld. If you're looking at the NLT, it says nothing they do will be impossible for them. Now, is this saying that if they're unified, that it's possible for them to actually build a tower to the heavens? No, that's not what that's saying here. Because when it says they, they wanted to build it to the heavens, in that culture, it was representing something that was very great, something that was very grand. What, is, what God is referring to here is the extent of their wickedness. Because here we see, again, with the sons of men and the different details, that they had completely turned their backs on God and were, were pursuing their own desires. But what God is saying, if they continue as one down this path, there's no extent of wickedness that will be unrealistic for them to attain. Give you a current example. How many of you would have thought that some of what we're seeing in our culture today would have been possible even five years ago? That's what scripture is referencing to here. When you remove God and as a people, you pursue something together then wickedness continues to grow. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, it talks about that from the beginning, people have, have gone their own way. And in Romans 1, it talks about how God abandoned them to their foolish uh, thinking and to do things that should never be done. It actually talks about how they began to invent ways, invent new ways of sinning. But God comes down and he confused and interrupted their efforts. Ultimately, he was confusing the work of Satan. Now, was this a curse or was it a blessing or could it be a little bit of both? Now, it was a punishment. And if you read this, have you ever wondered how did God scatter them? Like, did God just like pick them up and transport them or teleport them? It, it doesn't say, it just say that God scattered them throughout the earth. That's how my mind works. I'm like, well, how did God do it? Did like a wind come and pick them up and take them all these different places? I don't know. But scripture does say that he scattered them throughout the earth. Now, while this was a punishment, I also think there's a small part of the blessing in here as well. Because as we look, starting in Genesis, we see the promise of redemption come from God. 
We know the scripture tells us later in the New Testament that God will never leave us or forsake us. God will not let anything stop his plan of redemption. And by God coming down and scattering the people, it delayed the progression and the extent that their wickedness was growing. So yes, there was a punishment, but you can also see a blessing that God, now as they, as they were separated, some of these people groups uh, serve God, some of them continue to go their own way. That's where free will comes in. God it didn't just separate them and say, I'm not going to force you to follow me because that's not love. You cannot force somebody to love you. But there was a part, of, a small part of a blessing in here as well, the same way as we looked in, in the first or second sermon we did in this series, when God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden. That was a punishment. It was also a blessing. It was a punishment that they had to leave the Garden of Eden, but the blessing came in because God says if they, if they reach out and eat of the tree of life, they will live forever. So it sounds like there's a punishment there, but if you think at that point mankind had sinned and they were in their fallen state. So to live forever would have meant to live forever in a sinful state separated from God. So while it was a punishment that God drove them out of the garden, the blessing came in that as they left, God's plan of redemption was set in place because physically they would no longer live forever. But when Jesus would come as the fulfillment of God's promise, man would once again be able to live with God forever in eternity. So even in the midst of punishment, there's the opportunity to receive grace and blessing. See, God gave the original command to fill the earth and multiply. Why did he say to fill the earth? Why did he not just want people in one place? God wanted them to fill the earth and multiply so that his goodness would be spread throughout the earth. How many of you guys know God doesn't just want to move here at New Life? He wants to move throughout our community, throughout our area, throughout our nation, throughout the world. By filling the earth and multiplying it, having dominion over the earth, people around the world can experience his goodness and know who he is. But it says that the name of the place was called Babel. Babel means to confuse, to mix, or to mingle. And in, it's the name in the Old Testament used for Babylon. Anybody know that name? Babylon. If you've read through the Old Testament, you've heard Babylon. Babylon was, was a real uh, empire. It was a real place, but it also symbolizes sin and wickedness and humanity's desire to dethrone God and make the earth their own. So another way of saying man wanting to run the show. Babylon, again, it represents wickedness and godlessness. See, in the Old Testament, what, it, what Babylon would do when they would go and conquer a new city or a nation, they would, um, they would exile them to their empire and what they do, because again, Babylon means to mix and to mingle. What they would do, they would bring them to Babylon and they would introduce their own ways of pagan worship. They would introduce their own pagan gods. They would bring people in and try to force them to live according to their pagan uh, rituals. And when Israel, God's chosen people and nation, were, were imported there, obviously in Scripture we always see there was always a remnant that refused uh, to serve anyone other than God. But what a lot of people would do, and if we're honest, it's a lot of the same thing that we see today. A lot of the people in Israel, when they were exiled to Babylon, they would say, well, we're still going to worship the God of Israel, but we're also going to take part in these other ways of Babylon. They would mix the two together. But we learned last week, that the, that the only way, the only form of worship that God accepts is your life, meaning you're all in. You surrender your life at the foot of the cross. You surrender your life fully to the word of God in his way instead of our own desires. When you begin to compromise, it's only a matter of time until the things that you're compromising on take over the majority of your life. That's why God told the Israelites, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. He talked about how a little bit of yeast in the batch spreads throughout the entire batch. But here's what you have to realize for today. Satan wants to pull you into Babylon because if he can get Babylon in you, he can get Babylon in the church. If you're taking notes, write that down. If Satan can get Babylon into you, into individual believers, he can get Babylon in, into the church. 
That's why you see so many churches today compromising. I already touched on that a couple weeks ago, so I'm not going to go too far into it. But that's what happens. You make a little bit of a compromise because you're more concerned about being cool and appealing and hip than you are preaching the word of God. And it's before long you lose your power as a body of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. Should a church be relevant in how it tries to reach people and teach the word of God? Absolutely. Our methods have to change, but our message should never change. When your message changed, you become more like Babylon than what you have God. And that is a dangerous place to be. But see, God always delivered. There was always a remnant that that he worked through, even in places like Babylon. There was always a remnant to continue to be faithful to God, to continue to be faithful to his word. And God always used them to do great and mighty things. And in the beginning, I talked about how even though these are just nine verses, they have a huge impact and significance for life as we know it today. See, it's from here that all the people groups of the world originated. Why do we all speak different languages today? Genesis chapter 11. This is where it all originated. See, certain nations and people groups grew stronger than others. This is where things like rivalries and prejudices and and all of the things and issues we see that affect culture today stemmed from this event. And as people scattered, there were those who pursued God and those who continued to pursue wickedness. That's why we have so many different uh, nations, cultures, religions, all of these different things stemmed from this one event here in Genesis chapter 11. But now I want to I want to pull everything we've learned from Genesis together. See, in the beginning, we learned that God is before all things and he is after all things. The fact that he is before and after all things means that he is greater than all things. The creator is always greater than the created. The creator can't just decide, God, we don't like the way you're doing things, so we're going to redo them and we're going to do things our way. You can do them your own way, but it doesn't mean that it's right. God is right. He and he alone is good, and it's he's the one that sets the boundaries. And in week one, we looked at some of those boundaries, male and female, the value of life, relationships, things like morality, all of these different things. These boundaries are laid in Genesis 1 through 11. They're the foundation for the rest of what we see in Scripture and the rest of living a godly life. We've learned that God is, God's promise is faithful and his word is true. That means even when you feel like God isn't there, maybe you're here today and you feel like, well, I've been praying for something for a long time, and I'm not hearing God, so God's apparently just not there anymore. See, even when you, we sing this in the song we sing, even when you don't see it, God is working. When we looked at Noah's ark, there, were, there was a, a long amount of time after Noah and his family went into the ark before God spoke to him. But God was faithful even in the silence and the chaos. God's promise is faithful and his word is true. The worship that God accepts is your life. The worship he accepts is your life. It's not just going through the motions. You can come in here and you can do this and your heart stinks. You can come in here and you can worship. You can say the right things, but your heart is nowhere near surrendered to God. God isn't isn't interested in simply just the good motions. You can do godly things with wicked motives. He's not interested in just doing the right things. He's interested in your heart being surrendered before him. Last week, we learned how standing on the truth of God's word also means proclaiming his word. It's not just saying to yourself, well, this is what I believe. There's a time when you have to defend what you believe. Because other, listen, people around the world and in culture, they're going to tell you what they believe. And if it's going against God's word, as his followers, we have a responsibility not to be rude and jerks about it, but through love, proclaiming and standing on the truth of God's word. Last week, we also learned how sin must be and will be judged. And we were very clear last week to make sure everybody realized God's objective, his desire is not to judge man. But because God is the holy, just, and righteous God, he has to judge sin. Otherwise, he would not be just. But what happens is when mankind 
chooses to remain and walk in sin, then when God judges that sin, they experience that judgment because they're choosing to remain in that sin. But that's what the cross was about. That's why Jesus shed his blood is so that you don't have to remain in that sin. He took that upon himself to take your judgment upon his life. So if you surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you don't have to experience that judgment. God and God alone is to be worshipped, and nothing will stop his promise from being fulfilled. How many of you are thankful that nothing can stop God's promise of redemption from playing out? See, Genesis chapter 11 doesn't end well. And if you're reading through this for the first time, you've got to think, there's really no hope for mankind. Because you have in Genesis 3, when they sin, you have Genesis 6. They made it a couple chapters longer this time. They made it until uh, chapter 11. But the same thing happens again. Genesis 11 again is in with judgment, but then comes Genesis 12. I'm not going to go there this morning because we're stopping at 11, but I'm just going to summarize how it starts. Genesis 12 begins with a call and a promise. How many of you are thankful for the promise of God? Genesis 12 ends with judgment. Things aren't looking good for mankind, but then, and depending on what Bible you have, the heading actually says God's promise to Abraham. See, God called Abraham out of his current land and away from his family. God called, why did he do this? He called Abraham out of a pagan nation and pagan practices the same way that he has called the church out of the world. The, the, the word in the New Testament for church is in the Greek is the word ecclesia. And that word means called out and called to. You say, well, how, how can it mean both? It means that as the church, we are called out from the world, out from worldly living, and we're called to God. Is the church and as followers of Christ, we are called out from the world and to God. To walk in the promise of God, you have to leave the ways of the world behind. You see, in Genesis 11, what happened is the people wanted to be one, but what they failed to realize is that was being in one place isn't what makes you one. We can all be together in one place and not be one. But yet there's believers around the world that we can be one with because it's not about the location. It's about a common thread that unites us. See, Jesus prayed in John 15, Father, make them one as you and I are one. But there's this common thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation, and it's going to blow you away when we get into Genesis or when we get into Revelation next week and you see this thread continue to go through. What is that common thread? That common thread is Jesus and the blood that he shed on the cross. That is what unites believers as one throughout the world. But as people increase, so does sin. But we have a promise in Romans 5 where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Because God is greater than sin, his grace is greater than the pull of sin. That's why we're told to go make disciples of all nations, meaning people groups, societies, and cultures. Why? Because as we do that, we're taking that common thread of the blood of Jesus that unites us all into all the world. What's incredible is everything that Satan intends for destruction, God can use for blessing for those who trust him. In Acts chapter 8, verse 2, last verse for today, as persecution broke out against the church, the people were scattered and dispersed. You see, the people in Genesis 11 were scattered because they sinned. But in Acts chapter 8, verse 2, as persecution broke out against the church, the people were scattered. And this looks like a negative thing, but it actually helped fulfill God's command to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because as the people were scattered, what did they do? They didn't go hide. They bore witness to the gospel and the good news of Jesus. So as they were scattered, they continued to tell the world more and more about the good news of Jesus. God's promise and word cannot be stopped. And when you walk according to God's word and his promise and stand on the word of truth, nothing can stop you from living out God's purpose for your life because God is faithful. You're staying with me this morning. They're going to lead us in a song here in just a moment as we get ready to do the baptism. But if, if there's anyone here that has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you would like to do so, I want you to 
to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, and the way we, we do that here, I'm not going to have you bow your head. Um, the scripture is clear that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. We believe in, in encouraging you to say, hey, I'm in. And we do that. We don't do that to embarrass you. But we, if you've been here before and that happens, uh, it's happened a couple times already in January, uh, we celebrate, we shout, and we welcome you because that's exactly what's happening around the throne of God when someone does that. We like to join in with the, with the party and the celebration when someone accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, if my life on this earth ends today, I'm, I'm not sure where I would spend eternity. The good news is, is you can leave being 100% certain. If you're not sure, if you can't look me in the eye today and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if my life ends today, I will spend eternity with God in heaven. I want the opportunity to pray with you. So if you can't answer that question today, can you just boldly lift your hand up? We're gonna, I'm going to pray with you. Anybody this morning? Okay, a couple more moments. See one person. Let's praise this morning. Come on, let's give God a hand clap. <laughs> Amen. I love it. Because every time that happens, you're giving the devil a punch in the face. I don't say that arrogantly. That's what we're called to do. We have the authority of Jesus within us. Amen. Let's pray this together. Dear Father, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that Jesus shed his blood for me. I thank you for forgiving my sin. My desire is to know you and to make you known. And I thank you that heaven is now my home. From this day forward, I live my life for you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.